And after that, there will be a new heaven and new earth where he will reign forever. Again, as a king of kings and lord of lords. The Bible tells us in Colossians 1.13 that when you give your life to the Lord, you are transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear light. And we will be part of that kingdom. We will rule and we will reign with Jesus once he establishes his kingdom. Should we die before that time, before he comes to whisk his church away in the rapture? We will be with the Lord forever with the Lord, but when we receive our resurrected bodies, we will rule and reign on this earth with Jesus Christ. What a thrill that is. But as I got to thinking about it, he's already been here. And he has already offered himself as the king. And that, this is the story we're going to see this morning. The last Adam was born in a country of Israel, which was under Roman rule. It was chaotic. The people weren't especially favorable to the Romans. And then when you read the Bible, Isaiah saw the Son of Man, the Son of God, as a perfect ruler. It is forecasted throughout the Old Testament. And so by the time Jesus was born, even though their religion was straight away from God and apostate, the general feeling of the Israelites was that a king would become, and this king would take care of the Roman Empire. He would fulfill the prophecies of the Messiah in the Old Testament. You've heard of this verse, I'm sure, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, usually read at Christmas time. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. For there will be no end to the increase of his government of peace. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. The king was to rule from David's throne, his public, and he did come, and he started his ministry, his public ministry, by overthrowing the temple. He walked into the temple, the most sacred place in Israel, where God's presence was to be. And he walked in, and he cleaned out all of the animals which had made the place a marketplace in the court of the Gentiles. He cleaned them out. <laughs> He had a rod in his hand that had made reeds, and he walked in. He didn't need to use the rod. By the sound of his voice, by the presence of himself, he had that authoritative look that he could walk in, and everybody walked out. When John the Baptist doubted that he was the king while he was in prison, we read in Luke chapter 7, verses 20 to 23, if you want to follow the following, speaking of John the Baptist, when the men came to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent to us to you to ask, are you the expected one or do we look for somebody else? At the very time, he cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind. And he answered and he said to them, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear him, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who does not take offense in me. And they looked around, and they took a look at all that was going on. As Nicodemus said in John chapter 3, no one can do what you're doing except what he, God be with him. 
No blind person came to Jesus and walked away, but, but he was seen. No lame person came to Jesus and literally walked away. Paralytics walked away. Dead were raised. Truly, this was the Son of God. Truly, this was the King of Kings. Large crowds followed Jesus, the King of Kings, but the rulers of the Jews hated him and accused him of being in a league with Satan. Here's what they said in John chapter 8, verses 48 to 40, 49. The Jews answered and said to him, Do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? They literally could have told Jesus, You're demon possessed. Jesus answered, I do not have a demon. I honor my father, and you dishonor me. So that's how he was treated. Large crowds followed him because of the miracles, which we read in Luke 2. The triumphal entry of the king was a day that started with great enthusiasm, wild emotions. But underneath all of it, we hear the words of Isaiah. In Isaiah 1, verse 3, we read, An ox knows its owner, and a donkey its master's manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. I think one of the most saddest verses in the Bible are in John chapter 1. He created the world, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. The people of Israel wanted to see their king of kings armed to the teeth. They wanted to see their king of kings come in and wipe out the Roman rule. They did not want a king, as it says in Zechariah, a king who is just and having salvation. That is not what they wanted. They wanted a ruler after their own heart rather than their own heart after the king. So let's go to Matthew and we'll take a look at the story in Matthew as we see it in Matthew chapter 21, beginning with verse 1. The purpose of the triumphal entry is not to show the humility of the king of kings. That was not the purpose. The purpose was designed to that no one should misunderstand that Jesus, when he walked into Jerusalem, was the king. Jesus made sure that every part of the prophecy was fulfilled meticulously. Turn with me to Zechariah 9.9. You, you, have, you don't have to go too far back. You go back past Malachi and you hit Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 9.9. 9. And read it for yourself, the prophecy made 500 years prior to this date. Think of 500 years. If you th think about it in terms of time, it takes you back to where? 500 to minus uh, 21 would take us back to the year 1600 be like writing a prophecy 1,600 years ago and having it come to pass, literally fulfilled. Unbelievable. In Zechariah 9, 9, we read, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, speaking to Israel. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation. Humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus wanted to make sure that he fulfilled this prophecy to the letter. And so when you read in Matthew chapter 21, beginning with verse 1, we read, When they approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples. The night before, Jesus stayed in Bethany. Bethany is on the east side of the Mount of Olives. 
That's where he spent the night. And, on, and it is about a Sabbath day from Jerusalem. You know, uh, you, ha- you could only walk so far on a Sabbath day. Remember the laws of the Old Testament. You could walk, but only so far. And so this was a Sabbath day's journey from Bethany to Jerusalem. The king gathered his followers together, and they came to Bethphage, which is on the way to Jerusalem. And, it, it, and it's kind of interesting when you're there, having been there a couple times, when you come around the Mount of Olives, there's a four-lane road, and you come around and there's a, the bus, and they time, the guide times this per, perfectly, and you come around a hill, and there's all Jerusalem. You can see the whole city. I remember the first time I did it and they stopped. I just wept. And I remembered the words of Jesus when he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft would I gather you under my wings? But you would not. And so we're talking about the Jericho Road. This is the road from Jericho to Jerusalem, and they're on the Jericho Road. And when they come around the hill, when they approach Jerusalem and come to Bethphage, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples. Now, it's interesting that they're on the Mount of Olives because there's, on the Mount of Olives is significant because there's a lot of messianic things happening on the Mount of Olives. For example, in 2 Samuel 16, or 15, verse 23, Well, all the country was weeping with a loud voice because Absalom had just taken over the throne from David. All the people passed over. The king also passed over with over the brook Kidron. And all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness. So when you go to Mount of Olives, you can look on the west side of the Mount of Olives and the whole city of Jerusalem is spread out before you. The Kidron River, brook, if you want to call it that, it's dry most of the year. But the Kidron Brook separates the mountain on the east from Jerusalem on the west. And David passed there in shame. Remember that? He walked out barefoot. In Ezekiel 11, 23, we read this. The glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood over the mountain, which is east of the city, in other words, the Mount of Olives. When, when Babylon attacked Israel and take, took them into captivity, just prior to that, the glory of the Lord, which was in the Holy of Holies, that Shekinah glory, that light that was in the temple, departed. Remember when God, uh, they created the tabernacle in the wilderness? God came to dwell in the Holy of Holies. There was a candelabra. There was this uh, camp, the candlestick, menorah, in the holy place. And then there was a curtain. As you came in from the east and you looked west, there was this curtain. Behind this curtain was a square room that had the Ark of the Covenant. And there was a light in there. They didn't need a candelabra. They didn't need a menorah. It was lit by the glory of God. Called, the Hebrews called it the Shekinah glory. When Solomon built the temple, they had the same thing happen. The glory of the Lord came into the temple and abode in that holy of holies, which was a facsimile of the t- tent they had built in the wilderness. But when they apostatized, when the religion had apostatized and God gave them up to captivity, we see in Ezekiel that glory lifting up, going out the door of the tabernacle. And Ezekiel tells us, the glory of the Lord stood above the Mount of Olives, kind of patiently waiting, sorry to have to leave, but because of their sin they had to. And then you go to Zechariah chapter 14. Mount of Olives plays another role. In that day it says, in his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from the east to the west. 
by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move forward toward the north and the other half toward the south. I've stood on that mountain several times. The crack is already in the mountain. The mountain will be split in two. And in the millennium, in the reign of the king, water will come out of the millennial temple. And it will run through that crack in the mountain. Run down to the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea in which nothing lives, not even amoeba because of the salt content. It'll flow into the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea then will fill up and flow into the ocean. And people will fish in that river. And they'll fish in the Dead Sea. Fresh water coming out of there. Mountain has a very important place to play. So it's fitting that Jesus should come into the temple by the mount. And then he says to them, go into the village opposite you. And immediately you'll find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. At this point, the king sends two of his messengers to a city opposite of Bethphage, and he says, you'll find a donkey there and a colt with them, and tie them and bring them to me. Mark and Luke note that Jesus was to ride upon an animal that was unbroken. And we don't worry about that when the king of kings, the lord of lords, the creator sits on an animal that's not broken, it is broken immediately. When I was in Bible college in Omaha, I worked on a pony farm. And we had ponies, Shetland ponies, and we had donkeys on that farm. It's out there by uh, that oil company on the corner about way out west now. It's all filled in. We were uh, sanitary engineers on this farm. And uh, it was on 160 acres, and on the back one, they had a bunch of donkeys. And there were three of us working there. We'd walk with a pickup, and then we'd climb through the gates and go to the shed with our rakes and shovels. And uh, when and we'd get there on the back side, we'd always be tempted to ride one. So we did. And we'd get bucked off. But this didn't happen with Jesus. He's a creator. Have you ever noticed, just aside, this, you're not paying for this. <laughs> Have you ever noticed how the king of kings had absolute control of the animals? When they needed to pay a, a fine, you know, a tax, Peter says, <laughs> they, they're wondering if we should pay the temple tax. And Jesus said, we don't have to pay the temple tax. I'm the king. But to please them, uh, uh, go get a coin. They never had any money in a treasure because Judas was the treasurer and he was a crook. He was an embezzler, as the Bible calls him. So Jesus said to them, to Peter, go down to the dock. Capernaum is right on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. Go to the dock, put your hook over there, and I will tell a fish at the bottom to swim over there, pick up a coin that some Roman has dropped, and he'll pick up the coin, right coin, and he'll come to your hook and get it. And it happened. Remember they were fishing one day and uh, they got, came, they fished all night, didn't have anything to fish, any fish. And Jesus was on the shore and what did he say? You remember the story, you went to Sunday school, I think. And you remember the story where Jesus says, cast your net on the other side of the boat. Now these were guys who had fished all their life with their father and they had fished and he said, what? What? But they did it anyway, and what happened? God, the Son, commanded all the fish to swim into their net. So it had absolute control over the animals. And isn't that what the first Adam had? Remember when he was in the garden? God said to him, here's what you do with the animals, what? <laughs> Name them. Name them. He brought all the animals to them and they named him. How did God, how did Noah get all the animals in the ark? 
They hire a bunch of guys on, on horses, lassos, ropes, round them up. No, he brought one of every species, two of every species to the ark. He had absolute control. That's a side issue. Verse 3. If anyone says to you, it's not anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. Evidently, they were believers. And we read in Mark 11, when they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside the street, they untied it, just like Jesus said. Don't you like that? When Jesus says something, you can count on it. We talked about that this morning. You don't have to doubt it. When he says something, he says, I'll supply your needs. He'll supply your needs. He says something, I'll be with you wherever you go. What does that mean? He's with you wherever you go. You can't go anywhere where he is not. Psalm 139 says, if I go to heaven, he's there. I go to Sheol, he's there. I go to the bottom of the ocean, he's there. People want to go to Mars, I don't know why, but they want to go to Mars, he'll be there. They found it just like he said, and some of the bystanders were saying to them, what are you doing in the cold? They spoke to them just as Jesus had told them, and he gave them permission. Now we see the procession in verses 4 and 5. Then he took, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, Zechariah 9, 9, 500 years earlier. Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the full of a beast of burden. The disciples did, went, did just as Jesus had instructed them and brought the donkey and the colt and laid the coats on them and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats on the road and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. This is what you call a red carpet treatment. Somebody of dignity comes to our city of Hampton at the airport. You know there's no airport there, don't you? They spread out the red carpet if the president were to come. When the disciples went to carry it out, Jesus' crowd kept moving and inching along the road, and they met him. And at some point, when they stopped him, they caught, brought the colt and his foal, brought the, actually a donkey, and its foal. And the crowd began to spread coats on, on the road, the disciples put their coats on the donkey. Luke 19.35 says they brought it to Jesus and he threw their coats on the coat and Jesus put Jesus on it. Others cut palm leaves or palm branches. Palm branches were a national emblem of Palestine. The crowd was going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting. Now remember these crowds came from Galilee. You have, when Jesus left for the Passover, he left and on his journey to the Passover, the people from Galilee followed him. The people from Galilee were favorable to Jesus because that's where most of his ministry was. And as B.B. Warfield, a previous theologian of a past generation said, by the time Jesus was done with his ministry, there's hardly anybody sick. Can you imagine that? The amount of miracles that Jesus did in that area, and the Bible says they followed him. Why? Because of his miracles. So a large crowd was following him. And they were all going as a caravan up to the Passover. So most of these people were pro-Jesus physically. They were amazed at his miracles and they followed him as you would follow a miracle worker. And they started cheering. And they shouted, Hosanna! 
the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, Hosanna is a Hebrew word, which means save now. So they're saying, save now, save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Save now in the highest. This all happened when they turned the corner and suddenly Jerusalem's in sight. This psalm was sung at the Feast of the Tabernacles and at the Passover. In Luke 19 we read, they said, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> Matthew 11 Verses nine and t Mark 11, verses 9 and 10. It's blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. They, they saw him as the Messiah. You couldn't mistake what was happening here. This was clear to all. This official presentation to Israel of their Lord and Messiah, the long-promised king of the Old Testament. This is a prayer addressed to God for divine enablement to establish the messianic kingdom. Now something happens when they come. Look at verse 10, Matthew 21. When he entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, who is this? Who is this? The word stirred is a word which is used for a great earthquake. The procession stirred the whole city. I can see why. When you see the distance between Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives, and it's rather a steep valley, you can hear, you can hear pretty good, I think. I remember going to uh, Chiefs games. It's not chefs. It's Kansas City Chiefs. And we'd go, and the guy that had the tickets was always late. So we would drive up to the stadium about the time they were kicking off. And there was nobody in the parking lot, but the parking lot was crammed full. But Jim had a way of parking on the grass and getting close. <clears throat> he had a regular space way out there, but he said, if I go late... I can park up real close. One of those kind of guys. But when we got out of the car and started walking to the stadium, we could hear the noise for a long way away. And when these hundreds of people were shouting <clears throat> and coming down the hill of the Mount of Olives and then going up to the city of Jerusalem, the whole city heard this and they were stirred this is the same stirring that when the wise men came into Jerusalem and said, where is he born king of the Jews? Remember, we talked about that. It wasn't just three wise men. It was probably more like 300. A whole fraternity of scientists, a whole fraternity of wise men coming from the east, probably Babylon. And when they hit the city, the whole city was stirred. Same is true here. And the crowds were saying, that were following Jesus, they said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, their answer is kind of anticlimactic. You would have hoped they would have said, this one is Israel's great king, the Messiah. Whereas they said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, Nazareth was not a very popular city. It's kind of on the other side of the tracks. Remember when uh, Philip was introduced to Jesus, what he said? Can any good thing, what? Come out of Nazareth. kind of a slur. Instead of saying, this is the king of kings who's going to rule in Israel, this is a prophet from Nazareth. 
The king of kings, the son of man, is silent. Some of the Pharisees spoke out saying, Teacher, rebuke your disciples in Luke 19.39. However, Jesus stops at some point and he tells them, yeah, I tell you, this is such an important day that if these stones become, if these become silent, these people, the stones will cry out. God is determined that the world will know that Jesus Christ riding on a foal of a donkey coming down there is legitimate Messiah, the legitimate King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You're going to know that. And if you don't say anything, that block of stone will shout out. <clears throat> At some point, when he approached Jerusalem, turn with me to Luke 19, verses 41 and 44. Luke 19, 41 to 44. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it. I think Jesus had a great sense of humor. God does. You just have to look at some of the animals he makes and say, look at his sense of humor. Right? Some of the weirdest animals in the world. You've heard of the duck-billed platypus, haven't you? <laughs> they found him in Australia. He has a bill like a duck. He swims in water. He uh, has fur like an animal. He lays eggs and he suckles his young. And he has a poisonous bite. When the pioneers in Australia uh, put one together and he sent it back to uh, England, England thought it was a joke. Somebody put this animal together. Whereas God has a sense of humor, and Jesus, I believe, did too, that was, not, that was not what characterized him. What characterized Jesus was really peace, but also a broken heart. How can a man who knows no sin, how can a man who never sinned, who created the world, look around as a human being and seeing the sin and the snarky responses he got and the mocking he got knowing he was their creator. He wept over the city. Saying, if you had known in this day, even this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. I can't tell you the, the temptation I resisted to go back and completely explain the 70 weeks of Daniel and Daniel chapter 9. 69 weeks of years had passed since he orders to rebuild the city. And this was the end of that particular prophecy where it says the Messiah will be cut off, but for not for himself. They should have known that. They were students of the Old Testament, at least their rulers were. And they meticulously followed the law, at least the Pharisees did. And yet they blew by all the things that really mattered, as Jesus told Nicodemus, you're the teacher of Israel, and you should have known this. This was part and parcel of God's truth. You should know it. What is God going to say to us? There's people in the world that don't have a Bible. They're Christians, and they're trying to get a Bible. 
And most of us have Bibles we use and don't even know what to do with them. I mean, do you want to burn them? I mean, I don't feel good about burning it. Do you? So we stack them up. Some of you probably have never even worn out a Bible. I don't know. At least you have one on a coffee table. It looks good when I come. Seriously. I'm not making fun of it. I don't want to, but people, we need to know this book. We need to know this book. It's God's word. And as we talked about earlier this morning, you need, it's powerful. It'll change your life. He said, if you'd have known this day, this exact day from Daniel's 70 weeks of years prophecy, 69 weeks have passed. This is the last day. But you didn't. For now the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side and they will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. You didn't recognize what happened here. You knew the Old Testament. The king was going to come in on a foal. The king was going to ride into Jerusalem. Even the people who were walking with him, half of them ignorant of what was going on, shouted out, this is the, blessed be the Lord, this is the king. You know, they forgot something in that psalm. They're quoting this psalm, but right before it, a few verses before their quotation, here's what it says. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. They didn't quote that. That was right in that psalm. Just a few verses before it. You know what they wanted? They wanted the crown. They wanted the kingdom. They wanted the millennial reign of Christ without the cross. You know that typifies most churches today? They want peace on earth. Millennium. They want a kingdom. But they don't want to talk about the cross. They don't want to talk about his sacrifice, his substitutionary sacrifice in our place. You can't have peace. You can't have peace in this world until Jesus rules and reigns. And if you want it now, you've got to put your faith and trust in him at this point. Because there is no other way. And I can tell you right now, I don't care who's president or who will be the president. There will never be peace on this earth until Jesus Christ comes. There will never be racial reconciliation. There will never be any of these things. That's pie in the sky. The only way is through Jesus Christ alone. Personally and internationally, worldwide. In Luke 24... Verse 25 to 26, after Jesus is risen from the dead, he meets two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Remember that? Here's what he says to them. He said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory, they should have known. You got the whole 53rd chapter of Isaiah, right? They should have known. But because they didn't know, it's going to be rejected. You know what the sad lesson of the triumphal entry is? It's twofold. 
Two things that are very sad about this entrance. First of all, they rejected the king of kings, right? Who is this? Well, this is a prophet from Galilee, the city of Nazareth. You know, the other thing is worse. The king of kings rejected them. That's worse. I don't know your state this morning or where you are. But it's one thing for you to say, I don't believe in Jesus Christ, okay? You can say that. I don't believe in Jesus Christ. But let me tell you something. It's another thing when Jesus Christ rejects you. That's a whole different matter. Jesus' prophecy in verses, chapter 19, verses 41 to 44 came past, to pass about 40 years later after this scene. The Romans came in and they destroyed the city of Jerusalem. One of the things the Jews did to save their money before they gave up the city was take all their gold, melt it down and put it into the cracks of the stone. How did Roman armies get paid? By the loot they carried away from their captives. They upset every stone looking for gold. You can go to Jerusalem today and you can see the stones that the Romans rolled off the foundation of the temple still on the streets 2,000 years later. Because they rejected a king for 2,000 years, Israel, with exception from 1948 on to today, have had not had their own nation. And let me tell you this, if it weren't for the United States, France, and England, there would be no Israel today. There will be an Israel. Christ, the King of Kings, is coming back. Are you ready for him? I hope you are. I hope you go home or right now where you sit, privacy of your own mind. You can repent of your own sin and unbelief and look to the cross and tell the Lord you believe that he can save you. I'm sorry for my sin. I hate my sin. But I want you to forgive me. I know you will. You died for me. You rose again. And you're coming back as the King of Kings. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your openness. You revealed yourself clearly and yet the hardness of the heart. The blindness of Satan kept the people from trusting in you. We thank you, Lord, the next time you come, you're going to come on a white horse with an army with no weapons. And you're going to destroy all the nations of the world except Israel. And you're going to rule and reign from that city that rejected you, where the stones are still on the street. But, Father, you will erect a temple that will be unlike anything anybody has ever seen before and you will rule and reign from there. I pray that all who are here know you as Savior and those who don't, the Spirit of God will, will work in their heart and life. And I pray this in Jesus' name.